is Rory O'Toole. And my name is Matt Schultz. And this is How to Be. The podcast where we discuss ancient wisdom, modern hacks, paperback self-help books, and pithy platitudes. In the hopes of figuring out the best way to live this one precious and wild life. What did you eat for lunch? A sad, microwavable enchilada while scrolling reels? If so, you need to upgrade your life and your lunch. Join us as we talk to author Cheryl K. Johnson about the box lunch lifestyle. Hi, Matt. Hey, Roar. How are you today? Well, I'm doing great, and I, I'm excited because we have a special guest today. We do. We're very blessed to have a special guest today, someone who has figured out how to be, I would say. Um, yes. And we're excited to share her philosophy on how to be with our audience. So with us today is Cheryl K. Johnson. Cheryl K. Johnson is a writer and better life enthusiast. She left her job as a research director to become the founder of Box Li Lunch Lifestyle, a totally doable strategy to fuel your body, reclaim your spark, and build a life that'll make you proud. Cheryl understands the excuses that prevent us from making better choices with our food and time, and she draws on the courage and discipline from more than a decade of boxing training to show us how to stand up to them. You don't need a gym membership, a new job, or to throw out everything in your pantry to get started. You just have to decide to be your own champion. Cheryl will show you that the richer, more satisfying life you deserve is as close as your next weekday lunch. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. So we both had the pleasure of reading your book, The Box Lunch Lifestyle. And what struck both of us is actually that it opened with the same quote that we use in our intro from Mary Oliver about living, how we're going to live our one precious and wild life. And so that was a lot of synchronicity for us. And the question that really drove us, I think, to start the podcast and right in your bio, you say that you're a better life enthusiast and we are definitely better life enthusiasts on this podcast trying to figure that out. Yes, that that Mary Oliver line sent us all searching for answers. <laughs> and <laughs> we're excited to hear your answer today. Uh, Great. Oh, that's, thank you. I actually, I received that quote on a postcard from a university here in the Twin Cities oh. like 30 years ago. And I wish I could tell their marketing people just how effective that's been, that to this day, <laughs> although I, I did not attend that university, I do still have that postcard and it is still an inspiration for me. So whatever their, whatever their desired outcome, it, it worked on a bunch of levels. Yeah, they knew what they were Love doing. It. So Cheryl, what is the boxed lunch lifestyle? Can you explain it for the people who have not heard of it? Yeah, it's, you know, it's when I wrote the book, I wanted to, I wanted to create something that, that gave people who, if you're feeling like your days have been, have become kind of a, a slog, it's a book to help you start taking back your life, starting with lunch, right? I, we have... When you think about lifestyle, right, the, right now we have a $7 billion industry telling us that you, you need to do it right, you need to buy a product, or you need to buy into a particular kind of influencer's approach. And the truth is, is first of all, I think lifestyle is like, the, it, it's not an off the rack kind of approach. It's something that really is personal. And when you think about it, and you boil it down to its most essential pieces, it, it, there, there are only two lifestyle choices that we have to make every day, right? One is, what am I going to eat? And mm -hmm. two, how am I going to spend my time every day? Whether we're ready or not, we have to make these choices, right? You can't put them off and you can't not do anything. You have to do something. So when you think about a little bit of food and a little bit of time, 
that kind of looks like lunch to me. And the nice thing about lunch is that it reflects back to us to all the things that we know about good habit research, right? It's small, it's personal, it's doable, uh, it's not intimidating. For me, it's a good thing that there are no acronyms to remember because I don't remember acronyms. <laughs> I'll never ask you to remember <laughs> one more. But the idea is to say, if you, if you look at your workday lunch break, and these are typical days, typical days that have real constraints, right? These are not just any day you'd like to have. This is a day that has some limitations. You can use 15 minutes of that break for better food, 15 minutes for time for you. And that turns into a, a simple structure for practicing the kind of lifestyle that will really make you proud. Mm, yes. I think you described like the daily, I work in an office, Matt doesn't, but you described the daily grind of an office really well with like the gray cubicles and it can really feel like <laughs> a slog. And so that really resonated with me, sort of the ability to create, create a moment or a piece of time for yourself within that, that feels like you're have more agency and more <laughs> creativity. More creativity. You know, I, I did box lunch lifestyle today and I found that working from home, it was actually, it provided me with a bit of structure. Mm. So it's like, it can provide you with the, the opposite kind of slot. Like if the workday is too structured, it gives you a little space to branch out. But if your home life is too unstructured, it gave me a moment to key in, get intentional, sort of put a little frame around around lunch and have a more defined moment with it. Oh, I love that. I love that because for a lot of us, when it comes to lifestyle, it's not that we don't know what we might like to be doing differently, but you know, so even I can re remember when Michael Pollan's food rules came out, it was so simple and so basic to say, you know, here's, here's the simple approach to eating. And everyone said, yes, this is exactly right. Well, when do we do that? Well, we're going to do that sometime. Well, you can make some of those choices just at lunch. Or, mm. you know, it's not that we don't know that there isn't this uh, second place dream waiting for us, this thing that we know that we want to do that we just never, that never quite makes it to the top of the list. We know that that thing is there, but when? There's never extra time, but it's an opportunity to repurpose that time, right? That we can defend for ourselves and use it and actually practice that lifestyle that we'd like to have. Yeah, so the, the main crux of your book are, has to do with the, the 15 minute lunch you have, like the kind of lunch you eat mm -hmm. and the second place dream that you devote time to. And it's based on a 30 minute lunch break. So incredibly achievable. Would you mind fleshing out those two components for us? Sure. So the, you know, so the idea is 15 minutes of better food and 15 minutes of time for you. So when you say better food, what does that mean? Well, this is another great opportunity to to find for ourselves what better food is. Because depending on your resources or your allergies or your corporate kitchen or lack of or your desire to cook or not cook, all of that can be custom, it can be hand tailored, like handcrafted to fit your lifestyle. So a couple guidelines that I suggest with food, if you're looking to level up, is to say, two vegetables at lunch, not just one. So it's not just the carrot sticks with the sandwich. It's getting two vegetables in, which is a little trickier, but also kind of crowds out some of the other more highly processed foods that we might opt for. And also to choose to try eating wheat just once a day. And it's not because wheat is the enemy, because wheat is actually delicious. <laughs> Like, I, I love all of the wheat foods, but the, but the idea too is to say, you know, if you're, if you're eating wheat-based products at every single meal, it's probably a lot of more processed food than you might want. So this is a way to, to kind of game that and make different choices. So the idea is to take that 15 minutes, make food for yourself and either bring it or enjoy it in your home 
and actually eat and chew for 15 minutes. Just do that. Look at what you're eating, smell it, experience it. Notice the color and also notice what you really like or don't like about it. Because I've had people say to me too that when I actually slowed down and chewed this food for 15 minutes, you know, this stuff that I thought I liked, I don't really like this. I'm eating this because somebody told me this was the right thing to eat, or mm -hmm. I'm eating this because it's just the easiest, most convenient thing, but I don't really enjoy it. And this is an opportunity to just say, okay, well, if you wanted to do something different, like how would that, how would that change? So I the first 15... I was going to say, it's really interesting to me because what you're saying, I don't think you ever explicitly say this, but really you're talking about a very quiet, simple mindfulness practice of being present with the one activity that you're doing and cueing in all your senses in that moment. And so that's a, also a really interesting way of getting in your mindfulness time in your day that we also, I think, struggle to find time to do. Yes, absolutely. And then to pair that better food with 15 minutes of something that isn't it about productivity. It isn't something that, you know, it's what I call a second place dream. So first place dreams, like we know what, we know what first place dreams are. The first place dreams are the kinds of things that they usually have some kind of status or maybe money associated with them. These are public things like your career or your marriage or your book or winning an Oscar or, you know, these are big accomplishments, right? These are, these are kind of milestone things and these are public things and they're probably things that you talk to people about. People know this about you. And then there are what I call second place dreams. And these are the more personal things. So these are the, the quiet aspirations like learning to speak Japanese or learning to paint or doing origami or learning about some kind of, you know, what, whatever your, whatever your personal kind of quirkiness is like that, that's the, that's your second place dream. And, you know, why, and it's not a second place dream because it's less important than a first place dream. It just, it's the kind of thing that it's always second on the list or third or fourth. And, and why don't these things make it to the top of the list? Well, I think it's probably because someone uh, told us that we're not good singers or someone has said, oh, well, there's, there's no money in that. Or, or, or I think we tell it to ourselves when we say, this isn't the right time. It, it, there's, there's not going to be a not busy time. There's few of us get that luxurious, like open stretch of space where we could just pursue anything because we wanted to. But if that's something that you're drawn to, today is the right day to make that investment in yourself, right? So if you had even that 15 minutes, it's the opportunity to both satisfy that second place dream, which is what I think feels really unsatisfying when we have these you know, when people have these perfect lives on paper and then still at the end of the day, just think, really, that's all there is. I think it's because we're shortchanging some of these second place dreams, these quiet things that we maybe don't tell other people about, but, but they're not, they're not going away. And if you, if you've, because I know you've probably both read James Clear's work about mm -hmm you know, habit change. And I love when he talks about identity-based habits, when he says it's so much easier to, to be that person, to live that life when you identify as that person. So his example is, you know, rather than saying, if you're offered a cigarette and you're stopping smoking to say, oh no, thank you. I'm trying to stop smoking to say, instead, if you're offered the cigarette to say, oh no, thanks. I'm not a smoker. Mm -hmm. Well, I love the opportunity of this time, even during you know, that small window of 15 minute lunch break time to say, you know, I am a photographer or I am a writer. And because if you do it today, even for just 15 minutes, you are that person. There's no reason to believe that you can't do it. 
Yeah, it's very, it's, it's interesting. I think when I did box lunch lifestyle today, I didn't fully understand the, the second place dreams assignment. And, you know, I'm, I'm a writer and there are things that I have to work on and that's my passion. I'm, I'm very lucky that I get to do my passion for, for my job, but obviously there are more pressing deadlines and then there are pro long-term projects that I wish I had more time for. So that's what I did uh, with my second place dream, but that's, that's not quite what you're describing, what you're describing it, because that's still my, my front facing public ambition that does get mm. a lot of airtime in my life. And I, and I will mm. work on it I, I, at some point during the week anyways. And it's interesting to think what, what are those things that I'm really ignoring because I'm either working towards my ambitions or if I'm not doing that, I'm kind of crashing and watching TV and, you know, what, what the kids call bed rotting, where you're just <laughs> like sort of tumbling in the sheets. <sighs> so yeah, R Rory, do, do you have a sense of what your, I, I was thinking about this when I was reading the books. I think I have three that I, these are three things that I dabble in. And I know you talk about being a dabbler in the book, which I love because I consider myself a dabbler, but I often, those are the first things that get neglected. So one is like one thing that's really been neglected recently for me has been yoga. So I have not been doing my yoga. I would love, and saying 15 minutes at lunch is so achievable, which I think is a huge part of the book. Like just do, you know, it's, it gets you started. You know, I would love to write, my po have more time to write poetry and I really want to get into birding. And I'm very fortunate that I work on a college campus with a lot of birds. So um, I plan on bringing my Sibley field guide tomorrow and walking around the campus <laughs> to look at some birds. I think it's, you know, something I'm actually really looking forward to and a great way to express that second place, second place dream. And another thing that you're talking about, I think, is... And, and James Clear, which resonated, I think, with Matt and I both is it the identity doesn't have to be linked to achievement. It just has to be linked to some participation. So I would always be reluctant to say, like, oh, I'm a yogi, even though I've been doing yoga for a while, because I'm really still bad at it. <laughs> so I don't want to say I don't want someone to ask me, you know, oh, show me. Really? You're, you're a yogi? Show me crow pose for 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> but it's this gentler approach that takes, you know, achievement sort of out of the equation. Yeah, I love that. And I love the way you said that because there is something, this really is a challenge for people to be active. Because what I, what I, what I hope people will remember is that you can, you, know, you can spend your whole life thinking about eating the apple, right? We can spend our whole lives in our head, or you could just eat the apple and enjoy it. And also to say, if you're someone who's never tried yoga and you've always thought about trying yoga, there's no reason why you couldn't take just 15 minutes and try it one day. And you might love it. You might not love it. It may not be enough time to really understand what your relationship with yoga might be, but you've, you've tried it. And it's, it's in terms of things that I, I think at the end of our lives, a lot of us have the potential to regret some of the little choices that we could make. There, I mean, there's so many choices, we, so many things we don't have control over, right? But there are a lot of little choices that we do. And this is a reminder of those things too, is that you could try this and you might love it right away. You might not know, but at least you will have tried so that, again, you said, so, you know, habit changers or people who want to experience more in life, you just need a place to start. And this could be that place. Yeah. And, and one thing I got from your book was that don't get stuck in the planning phase or the prep preparing phase. It's like, just right. do it. Like to do yoga for 15 minutes, I don't even think you need a mat, okay? You just need you don't. a towel mm. or a mm. rug, your regular old, you know, area rug to do it. And you can you can try it. And if the mat, if you're like, I need a mat, you'll get there eventually. 
But I think that we get very discouraged and very bogged down about doing things the right way, even if it's just these little things we do on our own that no one's seeing. Yeah, that's really important because that's that's kind of the the fuel behind some of this too, is that we're also, I think, as adults, maybe not all that good at giving ourselves credit for what we do. And maybe some of us, and I'm I'm as guilty of this as as anyone. I'm I this is not what I am best at, is you know, being kind to myself. I'm I'm really good at being the disciplinarian, not so good at being kind, but this is also something to practice, right? And why not do that on a small scale with something like lunch to say, I'm proud that I tried this. I'm sure I didn't look like that person doing it, or I didn't, I didn't finish anything. And that's, that's the other thing is that people may think, well, I don't have enough time. It's not enough time to matter. But I think having the experience and even just showing yourself that you will and you can show up for yourself and try something, even if you're not the best at it yet. Everyone is new at everything, but I, I don't think we're often very good at giving ourselves credit for that kind of practice and, and just being, being kind and showing ourselves a little mercy, right? To say, the first time you do yoga, I'm, I'm guessing you're probably, it's, it may not be the experience you think it's going to be, but Everybody is new, and that's that's good for us to remember as adults. So, I one a practice that I've been doing for years and years is uh, morning pages from Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way. And sometimes when people hear they do this, they ask me, "Well, do you have to do them in the morning?" And I usually say, "I that I think there is a reason why it's prescribed for the morning, but probably the best time you do them is when when you do them." When you do them, um, exactly. Do yes. you ever have people ask you, like, could this be the box dinner lifestyle? Could this be the box <laughs> breakfast lifestyle? And I say, if you can get your act together and, and for breakfast, I say rock on because I'm not yeah. that person. <laughs> That's just there. There are too many other demands on on me in the morning to to make something handcrafted and personal for me happen. But if you could do it and that's when you did it, it's absolutely when you should do it. And one of the reasons I I like lunch as a model is because for I think for many adults, it is a time when you have a little bit more autonomy, where even if you're in a high pressure job, or you have other kinds of demands on your day, other responsibilities and obligations, in addition to your paying work, sometimes lunch is the only time you can hide or escape or carve out or defend for, your, for yourself. It tends to not, for people with families, have the same kind of, like, others dependency meal wise mm-hmm. like breakfasts and dinners do because you know if if the kids are just going to eat mac and cheese at dinner and that's what you're making then that's what you're going to do and whether or not that involves the vegetables or you know your second place dream is to try being a vegan well you may not be able to do that that easily at mm-hmm. dinner but you could try it at lunch and just see what you think of the food and how you, how it makes you feel and it's at least a, a way to do that um, one thing about box lunch lifestyle is that it it is a challenge to practice whatever kind of agency you can and make it work for you, right? So if it works for you in the morning, if morning pages work for you in the afternoon and you actually do them, that's great. And for box lunch lifestyle, people say, well, what if I only, you know, I only have 20 minutes because I'm a shift worker and I have to walk to this place or I have to check out with a time card or I'm a long haul trucker and I don't really know when I get to take my breaks, everything, or I'm an EMT and things are unpredictable. You make it work how it works for your life, but it is, it's a hundred percent flexible and a hundred percent relentless in that it is a cultural, a, a culturally accepted meal for us that it's going to show up again tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And it will reflect back to you if you look at it that way as this is what's really happening in my life today. And if you like that, that's great. If 
there's something you want to change, this is a place to make different changes. But it is that reminder of what really makes it to the top of the list on a typical day. So for me, I always take an hour lunch. Should I do 30-30? You should do what works for you. Whatever works for me. Okay. I like that. Yeah. Because this is not, I mean, it, it really is about whatever that most satisfying experience is for Rory, mm. right? It doesn't matter what works for anybody else. And there are people for whatever reason, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, an hour, whatever, whatever amount of time they have, then, you know, they, it, it works for them because, you know, they have a different kind of attention span than I do. Or maybe you have, um, I, I know someone now who's, um, whose second place dream is related to racing Mini Coopers. I did not know this was a thing. It's a thing. It's a big thing. And he can't actually go out and race the Mini Cooper, but he can use this time when he's home officing, he can go out to the garage or he can make sure that he has deadlines set up for when they need to submit for different kinds of events. But he can participate in this way. And it really depends. He needs more time and actually has more time to make that happen. And that's great. But whatever, um, like if you had two minutes for yourself today, that would still be better than zero minutes. Okay, so talking about second place dreams, and Matt and I talk about this a lot, but it's like, I do have these dreams that in one way excite me, but in the other, and you talk about how it should be something you look forward to, something that excites you, Mm -hmm. but in the other sense, I'm overwhelmed by it and it feels daunting. Like to even pull an example from your book, Reading War and Peace. I've been talking about Reading War and Peace probably Mm. since I could read. (laughs) (laughs) Mm. It's our white whale. (laughs) I would love to read it, but I'm also overwhelmed at the thought. It also, it's not pure excitement, if you will. So can we talk about Second Place Dreams is all, is it possible? I mean, in a way, it is still going to be an accomplishment, even though it's not Mm -hmm. terribly front front facing, I guess. Well, the, the, the question is, why do you want to read it? That would, that would be an interesting thing to think more about because is it is it because you are genuinely curious or yeah. it could be because there is some kind of status and and I can there there is some kind of status like in air quotes associated with I have read this particular piece of literature because I you probably don't know this but I I just ended a complicated relationship with Anna Karenina for the same reason. Yes. So I had saved, I had saved this beautiful edition of Anna Karenina until we moved into our new house and I'm going to sit in our new house and I'm going to look out at the view and I'm going to read Anna Karenina finally after all this time. And I, I did, I did not like this book. Mm. I didn't like the characters. I, um, it doesn't change how I feel about Tolstoy, but I finally had to accept the fact that I had an idea of what it meant to have read that. And life is too short. Mm. There's other Tolstoy. There are Tolstoy short stories. But I I do think that there's something, you know, again, in terms of, you know, when you mentioned thinking about this as a kind of mindfulness practice that you can do when you're thinking about the food and observing that, I think we can use that same kind of approach to be mindful of why we're choosing those things that we, that, you know, that we spend our time with and, and to say, I have an idea for this and I'm going to try this, but if it feels like an obligation, then maybe it belongs in a different place in my life or you start it and you really love it and you really look forward to it because the bottom line is really energy, right? Because sometimes we do get good energy from doing that thing we're supposed to do. So it doesn't mean that there couldn't be a place for something like that in Box Lunch Lifestyle. But the idea is to have the the net energy be a gain, right? To say, if until now what you've had for lunch is a Diet Coke, you're probably going to have a different kind of energy if you eat something with a couple of vegetables, maybe some protein, whatever. Anything you make yourself will be perfect. But also to say, when I've read this, 
there may be a kind of satisfaction that says, you know what, I read one more chapter, or I read the first chapter, and I think I'm going to like it, or I read 30 chapters, and I still don't know, or, you know, I read two, and I'm done with this. (laughs) But to say, why am I doing this? And is this really what's feeding me right now? And also being okay to say, yeah, now is not the time, maybe another time. So uh, it's interesting. A lot of different things in this conversation, different elements of it are all reminding me of one thing, which is this Instagram account that me and Rory really love. Do you know what I'm going to say? I have no idea. (laughs) You have no idea. My ARFID journey. Oh, yes. My ARFID journey. So it's (laughs) this incredibly sweet young girl I don't know how old she is. She's a child and she suffers from this sort of pathological picky phobia of food, essentially, Mm -hmm. that results in extremely picky eating. And as a way of working through it, they made an Instagram channel for her where she tries things and she takes these very mindful bites of things that are sometimes very scary for her. And there's sort of no, you can tell there's no pressure put on her to like it or to say that she'll try it again. Sometimes, Mm -hmm. sometimes afterwards she goes one out of 10. I don't think I'm eating that again. (laughs) Or sometimes she'll be like five out of 10. Maybe I would try this again in the future. Like, I don't know. So I, I, the, what's reminding me of it is the mindful eating, the openness to trying things. And yeah, and and also the the elegance of the small bite. Yes. Because we're we're talking about like these 15 minute, right? Like these 15 minute moments to take like a small, thoughtful bite of life. And yeah, like and and we don't really do that. And just in some sense, the the desire to have read. War and Peace. And and me and Rory talk a lot about our desire to have read versus our desire to be reading and sort of disentangling those in different ways. But yeah, it's such a big book that you almost wish you could just take one giant bite out of it and swallow it down and finish it and be like, there, I read it. You know, are you happy world? I read it. But Ultimately, a giant book like that has to be read in small, thoughtful bites. Yeah. And if we're if we're lying to ourselves and giving it a seven out of ten when it's really a two out of ten, we're not going to make it to the end, mm. probably. Yeah, that's so- right. And and who and who is getting shortchanged by that? Like nobody but us, right? When we're not mm-hmm. honest about those things. And yeah, that's really interesting that that you mentioned that. Um, I. I think it's, I think it's one of uh, Oliver Berkman's pearls of wisdom that when he talks about, when he talks about reading, that perhaps part of the reason why we don't read, those of us who want to read, and don't read as much as we would like, is that we get frustrated because it takes so much time, and that it's also something that takes as much time as it takes. You can't really two exit the way you can a podcast, which I don't do, by the way, but people do. But you can really only consume War and Peace at the pace that it gets consumed. It takes that much time. And I think that just culturally, it, it's harder and harder for us to just um, accept <laughs> that I don't have any control over how much time it will take. It will take as much time as it takes. But again, I think kind of a nice reminder for us in, you know, in this life to say, sometimes things just take the time they take and let's just show up for it and, and see what it means to us and see how it changes us. Yeah, I think that our obsession with like efficiency and doing things quickly, which is why we don't take lunch to just eat lunch. It's always, I can eat lunch, answer these emails, right. respond to these texts, you know, you know, manage my calendar, yada, yada, yada. So another thing you said that I really liked that per- sort of adjacent to that is it's supposed to give you energy, which I think we 
I don't think we think of lunch as that way so much as something that you have to do because you're hungry and you have to stop your day and do it. And then you can keep going with your day. And I, you know, we always feel that afternoon slump. Um, so the right. idea of like shifting your focus to something pleasurable, right. giving you energy is kind of like a concept I have never really considered before. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really important. And it's also maybe I hadn't really thought about this until now, but maybe part of it too is for me philosophy that I adapted during my corporate life of if it's possible. So it seemed like whenever we had a big deadline coming, you had the big deadline and then you scheduled your vacation after the deadline, right? Because people needed you until this thing got done. Mm -hmm. And then you could relax. Then you could exhale. Well, I'm a much bigger fan of taking the vacation like three weeks before the deadline. If you can do the vacation beforehand, invest in yourself early because number one, the deadline always gets pushed out a day or two, right? It's always like, this is the deadline, but now we need just two more days. Now we need just four more days, or this person couldn't do this thing, so we need just another week or two weeks, and then you're pushing that time. And so you're running on fumes energy-wise at the time when you most need to be on. So if you can invest in yourself before that hits, so if you can think about kind of the the midpoint of your shift and whether you're super hungry or not, or whether you like, this is the right time. There's something to be said about making that investment of energy before you hit the wall, like rather than, and believe me, I'm, I'm, you know, the, the slump hits and you get the other cup of coffee, <laughs> you do what you have to do to push through, but it does help to say in the middle of your shift before you get tired, what can you do to treat yourself, right? This little oasis in the middle of the day to say, well, here's this nice food that, you know, that morning mat made for afternoon mat. You know, here's this nice thing that, you know, that Rory like put this thing together and made this plan so that midday Rory gets to do this thing that she's really looking forward to. But to have that kind of energy going into the afternoon and then, yeah, it makes for a good work day. But I mean, even even more importantly is that you know the workday ends and then you have your life life, right? <laughs> the actual living life, which you know it doesn't doesn't mean that your work not everyone's work life is a drag. A lot of people love their work life, but there is life beyond that too. And wouldn't it be nice if you weren't just kind of crawling across the finish line at five or six or seven o'clock at night. And then what do you have for those other people or animals or events or whatever is in your life in the evening to have the kind of energy you'd like to be able to show up for them or for yourself when you're your non-work self? Well, I think what's so interesting about the I what you said, like the idea of taking the vacation before the end point, before the deadline, and and just sort of the idea, like of choosing the fact that you've chosen for your book, the midday meal and the midday, is there. There's a radicalness in that because we love beginnings and endings, and we, I think we have this, we obsession with morning routines culturally, like seeing what celebrities' morning routines are. And these influencers who have these morning routines, and and you can see they're very broken up into my spiritual time, my family time. And it's almost like there's an, an acknowledgement there that I'm about to I'm about to not be present for the whole rest of the day. So I need to front load everything meaningful here because right here I can sort of control it. But in and I think it's it's so important to, I, I mean, I think it's great to make time for things at, at different points in the day, and and but we we often forget about about the middles. I you know I'm an, an observant Jew, and we have three three daily prayers, and they're each associated with a different patriarch, and and you get the sense that the midday one gets the least 
gets the least love somehow. <laughs> it's the shortest. The liturgy is kind of a little more bland. The the middle patriarch Isaac in the new um, Marilyn Robinson book about Genesis, he's called the most boring patriarch by Marilyn Robinson. So we're, almost... <laughs> <laughs> we're primed to dismiss the middle and say, okay, I'll front load the beginning and then I'll recoup. I'll recuperate at the end of the yeah. day, whatever that yeah. means. Yeah, I, I think this is a really important observation, and and it is it is kind of a there's a little bit of a, a sneakiness of it uh, to it behind the philosophy of it is that there's a different kind of discipline that's required to stop in the middle of something, and especially workday when everything when when there's so many expectations and responsibilities and you know obligations you know it's it's a lot about what other people need right and that could be work related it could be family related but it's a lot of other people need me therefore i can put what i need personally aside just a little bit longer or i can take care of it in the morning when it's not inconvenient for anyone else and that's part of box lunch lifestyle is that when we need this opportunity and a place to practice setting boundaries and a place to publicly say, and I would, I would invite anyone listening, if you don't already have a lunch break on your calendar right now, stop everything you're doing and put it on your calendar right now. And it seems like such a simple thing and you put it on your calendar. It could it can move. It doesn't have to be the same place every day. You can move it around when the day gets there because you'll have to just deal with whatever day you're handed. But it's it's your it could be for a lot of people your first public statement of I am taking part of this day back for me. And I think that can be hard because I think that there's also something, there's kind of this hero status of sacrificing or being available whenever anybody needs you to be available. There's really not anything wrong. In fact, you're probably doing everyone a, a service by saying something more like, I can't do that then, but I could do that with you at this other time. And to practice saying, this this is the time for me, and is it convenient for everyone? No, that's not really the point. It's it's that there's time for you and that that time for you actually happens. And if it's not 30 minutes, if it's shorter, if it's at 2.30 in the afternoon instead of noon when you'd prefer, that's also not the point. But, you know, the flexibility, you know, you have the opportunity to practice that, but it's also the extra discipline. And that that might be partly from from boxing, like the discipline of boxing. Like after you've been in a boxing gym for almost 15 years, you, you don't there aren't a lot of excuses that really work for me anymore. <laughs> you can't really tell me something that's that's so hard at work that or so scary compared to like some of the real life scariness that people think it's it's just lunch. You you can say you don't even have to say no to people. You can just say not now. Yes, the flexibility. I was thinking yeah. so like, well, at first when I was getting into the book, I was like well, it's hard for me to do lunch because I did. And then I was like, wait, no, it's fine. <laughs> like, what am I even saying to myself? I, I can answer my own questions with, no, these are not real actual hurdles. I also want to speak to the- I steal your lunch time though sometimes. You have to defend your lunch from me. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I'm coming in. I'm beaming in over the phone and- Yeah, wanting to chat. That's it. That gives I'm... me energy though. That gives me energy. Maybe I'm one of your- Second place. Second dream. place. <gasps> dreams. Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk about the concept of making your own lunch because that's a key cornerstone of the box lunch lifestyle is, and you don't have to cook, but it's essentially assembling your own lunch. Like it could be as mm -hmm. simple as putting a hard boiled egg, some cucumbers and tomatoes in a Tupperware. Mm -hmm. um, and I just really think that's a really interesting expression of care for yourself because you know, we express care through cooking for other people all the time. Like I, every, for every close friend who lives nearby, I always bake them something for their birthday. And that's me expressing care. But I've never thought of cooking for myself as an expression of care so much as something I just have to do to feed myself. 
there's something about even people who live alone and have to cook just for themselves. You know, it's something that they often don't enjoy or they find very challenging. Mm -hmm. So the concept of taking a moment to give your, like you were saying, morning mat, cared for afternoon mat, to put this together is really touching, actually. A touching way to like really show up for yourself in a way I'd never really considered before. I I love that. And I I hope that it is an opportunity for more people to kind of think about their relationship with food a little bit differently, that it's not really, it doesn't have to be like, this is the thing that you cross off the list. Although it is the thing that you have to choose. I mean, it is one of those just relentless choices. Now I have to eat again. Oh my gosh, we have to eat again. Oh my gosh, we have to find what to eat for this meal. We're going to do it again tomorrow and children need to eat all the time. Like it just, it never, it never ends, but you, you can use it as that opportunity to say, what, what would, what would be nice? What would be that thing that, that you look forward to? And the thing about homemade is that there is that, you know, the same way you would, I, I share that same kind of thing. I love to cook for other people. I mean, we're a small family, so I, I love an opportunity to make enough of anything to share with people. But to think about doing that for yourself, it really, it really is a kindness. And it also, it's also a way to take some of the judginess out of our food, because another thing I talk about in the book is you know, chocolate cake. I, I think we should all be living in a chocolate cake kind of world because I think that if you, like, honestly, if you make a cake from scratch, if you make anything like that from scratch, there's nothing bad about this. This is not bad food. This is not junk food. If you make this from scratch and you know what's in it, I think it's great. And I think you should have it for lunch every single day with some vegetables, but just eat it all the time because what a, what a treat, like why, why can't more meals feel like that? And it may be easier to do that again on a really small scale, like lunch, just some nice little thing just for you that it doesn't matter if anybody else likes Kalamata olives, you do, and you never get them any other time. So you could make something like that or, you know, whatever that is for you. But that's, but that is another example of how you know, just um, imagine a world where everybody did this, you guys. Like, so think about a world where everybody stopped at lunch and ate something that they made for themselves and actually paid attention to it and did something that wasn't just consuming media or consuming email or doing something that's productive that really is for the benefit just of probably somebody else and maybe for you professionally but in the long run you know there's just going to be more email but that piece of art or that stretched muscle or that whatever like that's not going to exist in the world if you don't do it then right that thing that only you can give to the world that's just not going to happen if you don't make time and imagine if everybody did that and then like what the rest of their afternoon or the rest of their world would look like. I mean, the, the implications of that would be pretty remarkable. I think, you know, a slower pace, better energy, curious people who have the bandwidth to just listen to one another and, and make a connection. I think that'd be a, I think that'd be a pretty nice world to live in. Yeah. I mean, people are, can be so well, I'm sure they're not actually boring, but if all you do is devote your time to your work, it's like very, you know, it, it's a one dimensional life. Um, oh, it would be people would be if if everyone did this, if everyone did some version of this, I think a lot of people would be a little bit healthier and a lot more interesting. I mean, yeah. think about what you would talk about at dinner. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be this thing that didn't work at work or what this person said or this thing that you're frustrated with or this thing that did or did not get crossed off a list. It would be more like, you won't believe this thing that I made, or I didn't even know that this kind of plant could live here, that we had it in our yard, or that I could see this kind of tree or bird. Mm -hmm. like, those are pretty interesting conversations. 
Yeah, I was I was just going to say when like conversationally we're obsessed with work. Like mm-hmm. it's all people talk about and it's all we know how to ask about and Rory did I talk about this with you? Yeah, like there was a day where I saw like three really amazing birds and it was great to have that as an answer to how was your weekend and to have sort of a, a new paradigm for conversation that was not based around the ordinary things of life, which are sort of like work and, you know, what do we normally say after how was your weekend? Like too short or something like that. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it would just be like, and it would open up a lot of new interesting questions like for example like when you mentioned in your book like crossword puzzle making like i don't care really about anyone's office job i have no follow up <laughs> most of the time when people tell me what they do for work i'm like up oh, no follow up questions what, 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 what. <laughs> and it's it's real you like you ask what do you do and you're hoping they have something that will lend itself to follow up questions but doesn't always work out but crossword puzzle making, I instantly have a lot of follow-up questions. And I think a lot of these second second place ambitions and dreams, because they're rooted in a person's curiosity, yeah, yeah, spark other people's curiosity as well. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I was just gonna say that it's and you, you know, you talk about you don't have it. And, I, you know, Matt is a very passionate person. He's much more passionate than me. But I think you talk about how, like, passion isn't your thing. It's more about, and I feel the same way, like, it's more about curiosity. It's more about yeah. something that you're interested in that you just want to explore. Like, sometimes the passion bar can be maybe a little bit too high. Like, oh, I'm not, I'm not necessarily passionate about too much in life, but I am curious about a lot in life. And now I can right. take... 15 minutes to just explore that curiosity. And if it escalates to a passion, wonderful. And if it just stays in the curiosity zone, that's great too. It just adds to like, you know, the depth of your human experience. Yeah. And and I think that that's too, it kind of ties into too what Matt is saying about when you're talking about people's, you know, I, I, I try to refer to it this, these days as their bill paying jobs. Like some people have jobs that, that really are, you know, related to things that they are passionate about, that they that they care about, or that they're curious about, or they're learning more about. But for a lot of people, they spend a lot of time necessarily like this is their bill paying work, and that's great. But that's that is rarely what connects us to other humans, right? Like what what you'll remember are those personal things, those quirky things, and and I think that the more people get to experience those extensions of self-reflection and self-expression, the more interesting they are. And there's more for us to latch onto when, you know, there's more potential for a different kind of connection. And you don't necessarily need to do that with people that you work with, but it, it, it wouldn't be awful, would it? If you, if you knew more about those kinds of things, I had a, I had a manager recently say to me that, he really loved the idea of box lunch lifestyle, and he had been practicing it himself. And he said, and you know, it never, it was a real eye opener for me because I hadn't really thought about the people on my team or the people who report to me also have their second place dreams. Mm-hmm. And I thought, <laughs> yes, That's yes, so they do. So managerial of him. <laughs> It it is, and and I and I love that he shared that with me because that that's a pretty vulnerable thing I think to admit. But I I it's true, and you know it's it's also a way that you know in in a workplace that it's a really nice free way for an employer or a workplace and an employee to meet in the middle, right? For real self care, real lifestyle, for real well being. Like when you talk about workplace wellness. All you really need is the the respect or dignity of your workplace saying, I'm going to let you have that time that you said that you needed. And for the employee or the, you know, the team member to say, and I'm going to use that to really invest in myself so that I am my best self, not my best worker, that not to be more productive for you, 
but to be more of the person that I'm meant to be because that happier person, that person living that more satisfying life, that life they deserve, that's the person you want to work with. Yeah. I think you said in your book, you're not just a resource for your company. You're like a full human being. Um, Right. And that really resonated with me. Well, we're coming up at the hour. Matt, did you have anything to add? No, I thought maybe we could I'll say a favorite lunch food or something to <laughs> wrap it up. I don't know, something cute like that. Maybe not. <laughs> I, I love a, I love to say my, I like just a sandwich, a classic sandwich, a turkey sandwich, a little bit of cheese, a little bit of mayo. And now I'll be adding two vegetables to it. Maybe some cherry tomatoes and cucumbers today. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Cause that's what we have. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I like lots of little things in little cups and I can like take a piece of bread and put different, some like different spreads and maybe some different vegetables on top and some tahini. I like to assemble each bite so that it's a little different. Very Mediterranean. Wow. I love that. You know, my, my approach to lunch is pretty straightforward. So a lot of the things that you saw in the book are the kinds of things, you know, my, you know, my secret weapon when it comes to lunch food is our eggs, because you can do, you know, I even just, uh, you can do hard boiled eggs, you can make egg salad, you can mix egg salad, you can put all kinds of vegetables into egg salad and make it interesting and easy to do more than one day's worth at a time. That's kind of a trick for me is that if I'm going to make soup or if I'm going to make egg salad or I'm going to do something like that, it's never just for one day. That's that's another way I can be nice to, you know, Wednesday Cheryl <laughs> by saying, "Here, this is already done for you. You don't you don't have to do it again today." Yeah. A good call. Yes. Well, thank you so much for being here and yeah. uh so much fun to talk to you guys. I just love the energy you have. And I love the way you're exploring these, that you can explore these not so light topics in very, very entertaining and enlightening ways. I I love these conversations. So thank you. It's really a treat to be with you today. Thanks. Thank you for saying that. We strive for that. And um, people can get your book on Amazon. Yes, anywhere you buy books online, the audio or paperback edition, and the and the best way to connect with me personally. So, if any of your listeners have questions or ideas or need a fist bump or a nudge to keep going, the best way to reach me is social media. Just does not get a lot of attention from me these days. Go to my website; it's boxlunchlifestyle dot com and. Uh, you can email me directly there from the website, and I promise that I will make sure that your listeners' messages get forwarded to me directly. Fantastic. And Great. I would just like to say I listened to the book on Spotify. You were kind enough to share a link, and you have a wonderful reading voice. Yes. Oh. Obviously, our listeners can tell already because they've just listened to you for an hour, but you know that could be a second place dream for you. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's interesting. That's that's good to know. Well, and and I will add this. Uh, if people are curious about the audio book, if you don't know about the audio book um, platform Chirp, mm. Chirp right now for the month of April of 2024, the audio book is only a dollar ninety nine. Oh, fantastic. so cheap, cheaper than any any lunch you'll ever get. And and all the basic information is really on my website too. There's a box lunch lifestyle one-on-one. So if you want, if you want to try this, it costs you nothing to go and take a look, but if you're interested in the audio and you like it and it it passes the Roy and Matt test. So it's, you know, it's good enough, you guys. So if you (laughs) wanted to try it, it's only $1.99 right now. Yes. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. It was a great conversation um, and I'm excited. It's 11 o'clock, so I get to eat lunch in an hour and I'm going to have that turkey sandwich with my cucumbers and tomatoes. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.